In this video, we're going to look at worked answers to all of these seven questions. If you want to have a go at these before looking at the answers, pause the video now and work through them. For question one, we're explaining why magnesium chloride must be molten or dissolved in water to be electrolyzed. We're going to start off by breaking down what the question is asking us. So we need to explain, which means give a reason why. We have magnesium chloride, so we know that magnesium is the metal, chloride is the non-metal, so this must be an ionic compound. And electrolyzed means we must be doing electrolysis. We're now going to start by drawing a quick diagram of electrolysis to remind ourselves what we're looking at. So here we can see we've got a very basic diagram. We've got two electrodes connected to some kind of power supply. And we know that electrolysis involves electricity. It involves the flow of a charge. We know we're looking to ionic compounds and the question is mentioned molten or dissolved. Therefore, we need to explain how that affects magnesium chloride's ability to conduct electricity. Since this is an ionic compound we're looking at, this is all to do with the movement of ions. Now, back in the properties of materials topic, we looked that ionic compounds can't conduct electricity when they're solid because the ions are in fixed positions and they're not able to move. But we did say that they could conduct electricity when they were molten or dissolved because then the ions are free to move so they can carry a charge throughout the structure. So we can use that to write an answer to this question. The first thing we're going to say is that when molten or dissolved, the ions are able to move freely. Therefore, they're able to carry a charge. And that will be our answer to this question. We don't need to explain why they can't conduct when solid, but that knowledge will help us understand why they can conduct when molten or dissolved. Question two asks us to draw and label the apparatus used to produce copper from copper two sulfate solution by electrolysis. So if we break down the question, we need to do some kind of drawing and then make sure we add labels. And this is for an electrolysis setup. So you can draw a very simple sketch of the electrolysis equipment. It doesn't need to be a work of art. So you can see here that we've got two electrodes connected to some kind of power supply in some kind of electrolyte. We now need to label all of those key features. And these are the four things we should be labeling. So we have the anode and the cathode. Doesn't matter which way around you label these electrodes. We then have a power source, and if done in a school lab, this will commonly be a power pack. And then we have our electrolyte, which in this case will be copper sulfate, because that's what the question tells us we are using. So we now have a labelled diagram for the apparatus used to produce copper from copper to sulfate solution. Question three asks us to suggest why the colour of copper to sulfate solution fades during the electrolysis. So picking out the key bits of the question. Suggest means think of a reason. You won't have directly been taught this. You've got to come up with a reason yourself. Copper sulfate is made of a metal and a non-metal, so it's now in a compound, and we're doing electrolysis. Now you should know that copper sulfate is blue because you'll have seen this when you've done the making salts practical and from when you've done the electrolysis practical. However, the actual colour doesn't matter for this question. So if you didn't know it was blue, that's not a problem. However, we need to know that the colour of this solution comes from the copper, comes from the metal ions. So quite typically in compounds like this, the metal ion is the one which gives it its colour. Therefore, if the question tells us that the solution is fading in colour, this means there must be less copper in the solution, because if the copper gives us its colour and the colour is fading, therefore it makes sense that there's less copper. Now, because we're doing electrolysis, the only way we can have less copper in the solution is 
as if we're producing copper metal at the electrode. So to help illustrate this point, I've drawn a quick diagram and we can see that we've got copper ions in the solution and that will make the solution blue. And we then take those ions out of solution to form copper metal at the electrode. And since we're removing the copper ions from the solution and we change them into copper metal at the electrode, the solution becomes less blue. So we can use this to write our answer. So we'll start off by saying that the solution is blue because of the copper ions. The number of copper ions in the solution decreases as we form copper at the cathode, which of course is the negative electrode. So as the concentration of copper decreases, the colour fades. For question four, we're going to explain how copper is produced from copper 2 sulfate solution by electrolysis. So this is an explain question, so we need to give a reason why. We know that copper is a metal. Copper sulfate is an ionic compound because the copper is the metal and the sulfate is the non-metal. And we're doing electrolysis. We can also disregard the sulfate part of this because the question is just asking us about the copper. So we don't need to worry about the non-metal part of this. We started off by writing down everything we know about copper. So we know that copper is a metal, so it's going to be positive, which means this reaction is going to happen at the cathode, which is negative. If we're doing higher tier, we're also going to say that at the cathode, the copper will be reduced because it will gain electrons, because it has a positive charge, therefore it's going to gain electrons, which means it's reduced. We can use the phrase oil rig to help us remember this. Since we're in a solution, we need to remember that at the cathode, we've got a choice of either making the metal ion or the hydrogen ion. We know that the most reactive will stay in solution and the least reactive will be made. Now, when you've looked at these questions before, you might have been given a reactivity series. But this question doesn't give you one, so you might be wondering what you do next. But the question tells us that copper is produced. It's asking us to explain how it is produced. So we don't need a reactivity series. The question has already told us. It's not saying is copper produced in this reaction. It's telling us that it actually is made and we need to justify how it is made. So we can therefore say that if the least reactive is made, and the question is telling us that copper is made, we know that copper must be the least reactive out of copper and hydrogen. So the question tells us this. You'll only be given the reactivity series if you need to use it for a particular question. So we'll start our answer then by saying that the copper ions are positive. This means that they're going to move towards the cathode, which is of course the negative electrode. If you're doing the higher tier paper, you might need to say that they gain electrons here or that they are reduced. And finally, this means that it forms copper metal. So we've explained how copper metal is produced from copper sulfate solution by electrolysis. Question five asks us to state what you would see at the anode during the electrolysis of copper 2 sulfate. So state means say, However, for a question like this, you're still going to have to do a little bit of working out to figure out what you would see. The question asks us to say what we would see, so we're going to have to give some kind of observation. We know from panic that the anode is the positive electrode, and that for copper sulfate, copper is the metal, the sulfate must be the non-metal. So we'll start by breaking down what the question is asking us. It's asking us what we'll see at the anode. So we know the anode is the positive electrode and that's where the non-metal goes because it's negative. So we're going to be looking at what we will form at the anode, so what the non-metal will form. We know that if the non-metal is in group 7, 
we're going to make that group 7 element. If the non-metal is not in group 7, we're going to form oxygen and water instead. Sulfur is in group 6, which is obviously not in group 7, so that means we're going to produce oxygen and water at the anode. However, the question doesn't ask what we will make at the anode, it asks what we will see. And if we're producing oxygen and water at the anode, oxygen is a gas. So if we're producing a gas at the electrode, we're going to see bubbles of that gas forming. And we can use all of this to write our final answer. We start off by saying that the negative sulphate ion would go to the anode. We'll then say that sulphur is not in group 7. This means that oxygen and water would be produced. Oxygen is a gas at room temperature. So we would see bubbles. So even though it seems quite a simple question, just saying state what we would see, we've almost had a bit of a mini explanation. So in essence, we've explained why we would see bubbles at the anode during the electrolysis of copper sulfate. Question six asks us to explain why aluminium is not extracted from its ore by electrolysis. Again, we're explaining, which means give a reason why. Aluminium is a metal. The ore we find aluminium in is called bauxite, and that's aluminium oxide. And again, this is about electrolysis. So you will have learned that in order to do the electrolysis of aluminium, it needs to be molten. So the challenge is here is how do we melt the aluminium oxide? Now, the question doesn't ask us if it is possible to do this. It says why it is not extracted this way. So it doesn't say why it can't be done. It just says why isn't it done? So that's something useful to bear in mind. Because the reason it's not extracted this way is that it has a very high melting point. So in theory, we could melt it, but the fact it's got a very high melting point makes it very difficult to do so. And that's because in order to melt aluminium oxide, it's got a melting point of around 2000 degrees, it would require an awful lot of energy to do that. So our three-part answer to this question is saying that aluminium oxide, the ore, has a very high melting point. This means it requires a lot of energy to melt it, which would be too expensive for the company extracting the aluminium. The final question asks us to explain why the anode needs to be continually replaced during the electrolysis of aluminium. Once again, this is an explain question, meaning we need to give a reason why. We know by using PANIC that the anode is the positive electrode. And in the electrolysis of aluminium, we use aluminium oxide ore. Aluminium is the metal and the oxide part is the non-metal. So this question asks us about the anode. So that means the non-metal is going to go there, which is the oxygen. We also know that when we're extracting aluminium, we use electrodes made out of graphite, which is a form of carbon. Now, when the oxygen is produced at the anode, it reacts with the carbon electrode to form carbon dioxide. So that's taking essentially carbon out of the electrode to react with the oxygen to make that carbon dioxide gas. So the amount of electrode we have is decreasing because it's reacting with the oxygen to form carbon dioxide. So we can use all of this to write our answer. We'll start off by saying that the anode is made from graphite. Then we're going to say that we produce oxygen at the anode. And finally, that the carbon anode reacts with the oxygen, producing carbon dioxide which eventually will wear the anode away. And that's our final answer.